Welcome to Glasgow City Church. Thank you for joining us. Here are this week's announcements. If you wish to take part in any of the following activities, the relevant contact details will be available on screen. Come to a Sunday service in person for prayer, praise and worship and hearing the Lord's Word. Please remain vigilant, bring a mask and complete track and trace check-in on arrival. We hope to see you in person. If you are unable to join us in person for our Sunday service, you can watch the service video on YouTube or church online when they are available. You can also communicate with others using the interactive tools the platforms provide. Come and join us for our pre-service prayer at 10am to 10.30am at Glasgow City Church. It will be a time of great blessing and a great way to start off your week. Sunday School will be taking a break until the 31st of October. We ask all children remain with their parents. Thank you. JAM or Jesus and Me, our teen group, meet on Zoom on Sundays at 12.45pm each week. If you are a young person from 13 to 18 years old, you are welcome to join in. On Saturday, 8am to 8.30am, we'll be having an international prayer service with family, friends and partner churches from across the world. REACH is a group of young adults interested in studying the Bible together. They have a Wednesday meeting at 7.30pm, as well as social events spread throughout the year. Pastoral care groups are available to keep you connected with persons who will call you regularly to keep you informed with online church activities, pray with you and help you with anything you might need. Uncover Glasgow City Church is proud to host the 5th annual Uncover Music Contest on the 23rd of October. Come, praise, worship and fellowship with young Christian musicians from across the UK. At 11am on Sunday the 7th of November, our international service will be held with special guest speaker Pastor Peter Vincent. Come join our kaleidoscope of international colours and costumes as we celebrate Christ's mission to all nations. We do ask if you have a national costume that you do wear it on the day. Discover cultures and contexts within which the scriptures were written. Apply biblical truth to life in the 21st century and draw from the scriptures for personal growth with the Bible in-depth Bible study. It starts on Tuesday 9th of November at 7.15pm at the GCC Cafe, so don't miss it. Street Connect is a charity which exists to offer hope and opportunity of change to many who are disadvantaged and marginalised in society. If you are interested in helping our Saturday night church drop-in cafe and outreach, please talk to Andy in person or contact him via his email or number on screen. If you would like to give an offering to Glasgow City Church, please take a note of the details on screen now. You can either take a photo on your phone or take a screenshot if you are watching online. If you pay taxes, please remember to gift aid your giving as it will increase your giving by 25% at no extra charge to yourself. If you would like to donate using PayPal, you can donate using the donation link on the Glasgow City Church website. We thank you for your generosity once again. Keep up to date on church activities via our website or our social media accounts. Thank you for listening and I pray you join us for an event during the week. God bless. Well, good morning folks. Nice to see you. Oh, getting a wee bit of... How's that? Not better. Good stuff. Thanks, Ola. So I think Alistair's mentioned we're, we're going to be doing the Kingdom Mentoring course again in the new year. And if you're interested in that, I'm probably going to run it maybe around about the end of this winter, maybe begin, beginning of spring. Just we'll see what seems best 
as, uh, as we go into winter and, and so on. And the difference this time, of course, we have the, the book out, which has all the, the kind of basis of the teaching in it. So the great thing about doing kingdom mentoring now is you don't have to listen to me talking for 45 minutes each week. You can just read the chapter and then we more explore it together. So it's a three-month course. Um, it's really important you do you know, the whole thing. Really important you actually get the book and read that and work your way through it beforehand because that will make all the difference to you getting the most out of it. So if any of you are interested in doing kingdom mentoring in this sort of early part of 2022, uh, then you can message me, speak to me. Uh, for those watching online, we have a Kingdom Mentoring Facebook page, so you can check out the Kingdom Mentoring Facebook page. You can message me through that, and the book Equipped, Activated, and Released is available on Amazon. You, you can get that there. So good to be back with you in, in Glasgow. Beautiful Glasgow morning today, isn't it? Just <laughs> welcome to Glasgow autumn. Um, we were down in, in Wales, Helen and I were down in South Wales last week, and uh, of course the weather was better all over, but it was, it was a lovely time, and with a couple of churches down in Neath and Clenethley. And I met a guy down there called Steve, good name Steve, and uh, I heard a little bit of just what happened to Steve in the last week. So when I met him last Sunday, uh, Steve, a man a little bit younger than myself, was looking very alive, very well, very bright. And he did something he hadn't been able to do for many, 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 many years. He bent down and touched his toes. Now, the reason he did that wasn't just to show off that he could touch his toes, which I don't think I've been able to do for about the last 50 years. Um, but he did that because before the Sunday previous, Steve had hardly been able to get out of a chair. He had had 17 years of chronic back pain. He was on, wasn't this, 32 tablets a day. I mean, the guy must have rattled when he moved. 32 tablets a day for pain, and I guess maybe some tablets to counteract the effects of other tablets and all that sort of stuff that goes on. He'd been like that for 17 years. When he was sitting in a chair, it, he would be in agony just trying to get back out of that chair. His, his life had just been like that. He got prayed for a week past Sunday, two weeks ago today, in church, and something immediately happened. He had an encounter with the power of of the risen Lord. The back pain completely went, Amen. and he hadn't taken a tablet or anything since. He's got a, just like a whole new lease of life. And just, just wonderful to, to meet him and, and just see the hope in his heart. He, he, he got a, a prophetic word given to him uh, last Sunday, and as he left church, he was kind of talking about, you know, I'm going to go and see what I'm going to do now. You know, God's speaking to me. I've got my health back. I can move in freedom without pain. What am I going to do for God now? And that's something of the encounter with Jesus. We've talked over the, the summer months about encounter, and now we're talking about new beginnings. And an encounter with Jesus, we have an encounter with his presence, because he's living, he's alive, he's real. He's, he's here. He's not limited by any time, space, or any other dimension. We have encounter with his presence, with him. Very personal. We have encounter maybe with the power of his Holy Spirit, like, like Steve did two weeks ago. We have encounter with his word. I, I hope you have encountered with his word on a very regular basis. Certainly for me, as I read his word daily, you know, regularly, there's, there's an encounter with the word of God because it's, it's living. And it's active. And it, it, it kind of isn't just word on a page. It's, it's word and spirit. It comes alive into you. And we encounter it. And if you pop up the slide, first slide, or this, probably onto the second one by now, um, as we encounter Jesus, it brings what I call here, next slide if we can, a transformational initiative into our lives. A transformational initiative that brings about new beginnings. God gives to us in Christ Jesus newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4 talks about in, in, in baptism. And it was a joy just to see the photos of uh, Josh and Torian and, and Don of their baptism. Great to see Andy and Kenneth doing the baptisms. That was wonderful just to see you guys in the, the, the water doing that. Uh, and, and may you do many, 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 many more uh, as, as we see people become disciples of Jesus. And Paul talks in, in Romans 6, 4 about baptism, the dying to the old rising, and he talks about rising up to a newness of life. And that word means a newness or a freshness. And, and there's something that God has for us fresh every day. 
You know the famous verse, I think it's in Lamentations, isn't it? Which talks about his mercies, which are new every morning. It's not just like some old mercy that he gives you. He doesn't give you yesterday's mercy today. He's got new mercy today. He's got newness and freshness of life for us each and every day. And when we encounter him, this transformational initiative begins to happen in us and through us. When Saul of Tarsus encountered Jesus, now that was a pretty dramatic encounter, wasn't it, on the road to Damascus? And sometimes we can have very dramatic encounters. I I can think of a a very, very small number in my life which had such impact for years to come. Or we have, you know, just little encounters on a very regular basis because he's there to be encountered. Saul of Tarsus has this amazing encounter because he's, he's totally going in the wrong direction. He's totally going against God's purpose, kicking against the goads, it says. And he has an, an encounter with Jesus that brings a transformational initiative both in him and through him. And what happens in an encounter is something of who Jesus is is revealed to us. When Paul, or Saul as he was then, is blinded by this light, he asks, who are you, Lord? Now, he's not calling him Lord like Jesus, Lord, because the word Lord could just mean like sir. It was a, a term of respect. So who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. And he gets a revelation of who Jesus is. In the encounter, there's always a revelation of something of the nature and the character of who God is. And, and we grow in this knowledge of the Son of God. And also, God wants to release, he doesn't want these encounters just to be an experience for us that we can can glory, and that's okay to an extent, but God has purpose for us, and he wants to bring a transformational initiative that works something through us. Paul is commissioned into a totally new direction, and in no time, he's out preaching the Jesus who he once was persecuting. And God wants to bring us into ongoing encounter with himself where we grow in the knowledge of the Son of God and He releases transformational initiatives through our lives. Maybe not massive things like happened with Paul. Maybe not some world-changing thing overnight, but just initiatives that bring something more of God's kingdom and His will here on earth as as it is in heaven. We're going to look this morning at Matthew chapter 12. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses from 18 uh, to 21, which is a quotation from Isaiah 42, referring to, to Jesus. And we'll look a little bit of the context around these verses and something of the context of what's going on in our, in our world today. What are the sort of things that are happening that are dominating in our world today? And how do we bring something of the fresh initiative of God into some of those situations? We'll look at one big area in particular. So Matthew 12, 18 through 21. Well, it says in verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles <coughs> will hope. Now here's these words. Jesus is the fulfillment of the, the servant of the Lord who's spoken of on a number of occasions in the book of Isaiah. And Matthew, you know, showing here this is something of how Jesus fulfills that role. But let's look at the context that it was all in. Matthew 12 begins with a real context of contention. Now, Jesus wasn't unfamiliar with contention. He seemed to kind of attract it from a particular group of people, namely the Pharisees and scribes and those around them. And so he lives with a fairly constant contention. Uh, the Apostle Paul through, through the Begats has that contention with, again, the, the, some of the, the Jewish people, the Judaizers, who want to you know, bring everybody back under the law. And so this contention with these legalistic Pharisees begins in the opening verse of the chapter around the Sabbath, big questions of the Sabbath, which seem to follow Jesus around a lot, partly because he did miracles on the Sabbath, and they didn't like that. And also we find 
this continues in a context of healing again on the Sabbath in verses 9. Let's read from verse 9, in fact, just to give us something of the context here. Verse 9. He went on from there and entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They weren't really looking for information or an answer to that. It says, so that they might accuse him. He said to them, which of you has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? The answer to that would have been yes. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Isn't it amazing that you know, Jesus went about doing good? The Bible says he went about doing good and setting people free. He went about healing people and bringing good news. He would culminate his life by laying down that very life on the cross as a sacrifice for us all. He did nothing but good and bring life and lay himself down for people. And yet he constantly receives contention and criticism. <clears throat> and these guys want to destroy him. It says in verse 15, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. And then it goes on the verses we've already read. So we have a context of contention and a context of healing. In this contention, Jesus sometimes would, would answer. Sometimes he would ask a question back of those who were questioning him. But on this occasion, it says that he withdrew. He doesn't want to get caught up in this argument. He doesn't want to get caught up in fruitless conversation. He withdraws, but he continues to heal people. And let's think about, you know, today's context. What's the context that we live in today? What are the big kind of things happening in our world at the moment? Well, of course, one of the things that's dominated our news for a long time now is called COVID, isn't it? And, and, and it's still is there, is there about. Uh, we're probably fed up hearing about it, so I won't talk about it today. Uh, but what's it done? It's done many things, but one of the things it's done, I think it's, it's, it's exposed a vulnerability in our human strength. It's exposed a vulnerability. And that's something that I believe God can positively work through. Because ultimately, it's exposed what was already there. We are vulnerable people. And we need the rock of Jesus to, to build our life upon. That there's big issues around our, our economy, isn't there? What, what will the outworking of Brexit look like? Lack of lorry drivers. Uh, what other things are we seeing in the economy? You know, massive rise in gas prices. How is that all going to work out? And so two of the key areas that people are most interested in in life have been greatly affected or are being greatly affected. The area of health and the area of wealth. Three big areas in people's lives that people are concerned about are health, wealth, and relationships. Those are three, the three big areas for most people. There's been a shaking in the area of health and of wealth. The other big issue in our, our, our role today that I'm very aware of would be around the issues of kind of justice and equality. Now, I'm a, a little bit of a sports fan, so I like to watch some football now and then. And you cannot watch football nowadays without constantly being confronted with the whole issue of tackling racism. Now, that's, that's a good thing. These things, justice, equality, the righting of wrongs, dealing with racism and other such things, these, these are good things. All good in themselves. And yet, there's a caution, I think, because when the unredeemed heart seeks to correct wrongs, there's always a bias in our heart. Sometimes we try and correct a prejudice, but create another prejudice. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 that the human heart, the heart is deceitful above all things. We don't really know the depth of our heart's motives. Sometimes they get exposed in certain situations. <clears throat> I don't think any of us fully understand all the motives and all maybe the prejudice sometimes that's deep within our hearts. And the unredeemed efforts to bring justice sometimes go beyond righting of wrongs to sometimes create other wrongs. Sometimes they go beyond justice looking for revenge. Sometimes they're motivated out of, out of fear, out of anger, and often out of a, a, a wounding that, that brings its own type of reaction. 
What we need and what we need to keep showing as God's people is the redeeming grace of Jesus that forgives, that frees, that heals, and restores. You see, the verses we read, it talks about Jesus. He brings justice to the nations. He's the one who brings justice. He brings true justice because his heart has no wounding in it. His reactions are never reactions out of fear, anger, or anything else. He responds to us out of the steadfast love and faithfulness of his heart. And we need that redeeming grace that forgives and that frees, that heals and restores, that brings a true righting of wrongs. <clears throat> says in Psalm 89, 14, as it says in a number of other verses, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. God is a God of justice. God is a God of equality. You know, Paul says in, in Christ there's neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, barbarian or, or whatever, you know. He says, you're all, you're all one. You're all one. The dividing wall has come down. You're all one. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Some translations say mercy and truth. Any of those attributes are what we need. You see, when we want to bring righteousness and justice, it needs to come out of a steadfast love and a faithfulness, a mercy and truth. Not with, with anger and with trying to bring this and change that, but out of the mercy and truth of Jesus Christ. And so these verses show us where it begins. Redeeming justice begins by beholding this one, Jesus. Beholding him. Behold my servant, or that word can be my child, whom I have chosen. My beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, to all peoples. And notice how he behaves. He will not quarrel or cry aloud. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Jesus doesn't come with a voice of protest. But he comes with divine solution. You know, there are many voices of protest today, and some may well have something good to protest about, but protest of itself does not bring solution. There are many who can outline a problem. There are many who can make a diagnosis of what's wrong. It never solves anything unless we find the solution. And God is a God of solution. The ultimate problem of, of, of the human race is that we were broken in our relationship with God, our Creator. God didn't say, this is the problem, let me outline this problem to you and leave it there. He outlined the problem and then he brought the solution of the sacrifice of Jesus. And we need to be people, not of protest, but solution. Interestingly enough, if, if you consider yourself a Protestant, then you're actually rooted in protest because that's where the word comes from. And maybe we have to think about what that's maybe done to us. I just like to think of myself as a follower of Jesus and, and that's full stop after that one. But God wants us to be a people of solution, bringing the redeeming justice, where we don't cry aloud, where a bruised reed we will not break. See, it's about people. Jesus brings justice. He brings justice to the oppressed by healing the man with a withered hand. The next verses talk about a man who was oppressed by, by demons, who was blind and mute. And what does Jesus do? Outline the problem? No. He healed him. So the man spoke and saw and the people were amazed. Jesus turns things around. He moves into our situations. Whatever is oppressing people's lives, Jesus moves in with his divine solution to turn things around. And we are those who follow after him, who behold him, who have the same spirit upon us, that we might bring a righting of wrongs into our world, not by protest, not by crying out in the streets, but with that gentleness of spirit that takes a bruised reed and brings healing to it. That takes a smoldering wick where life's just about gone out and, and blows gently with the breath of life upon it and brings it back to life. We consider some of the issues around today that there's, there's much talk of in the whole issue of racism. And it's been a curse on humanity for so, so long. But where lies solution? Solution lies here today. As I look around at 
different nations and races and ethnic backgrounds, and our oneness in Christ Jesus, our love for one another, because we're beholding the chosen one of God. And in him, we find a togetherness, a unity, a love. We find solution. We find an equality. We find a justice. We find a righting of wrongs. We find true value and true definition. We find true value and true definition. You know, sometimes people are crying out today and saying, I, I, I must be respected for who I say I am. But there's something far higher than that. Far, far higher. That's where we're truly valued because of who God says we are. Many people cry and say, this is who I am, trying to define themselves as this, that, and the next thing. And you must respect me for who I am. Well, respect's a good thing, but there's something so much higher. It's value. True value. Jesus has said earlier, how much more value is a man than a sheep? He places such value on us that he came and died for us. Such value. And God puts this true value upon us by who he says we are. In Christ Jesus, he brings us to himself. And even as he speaks these words, these words are spoken, spoken over Jesus. Behold, my servant, my child, whom I've chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. And as you are found in Christ, receiving what he has accomplished for you, so the Father speaks over you, his beloved, his son, his daughter, his servant. He chose you. You did not choose him, but he chose you. Chosen. Not left out, not rejected, not told you don't belong, chosen, belonging, beloved, with whom he is well pleased, with whom his favor rests. You know, these words are so similar to the, the two great occasions where Jesus hears the voice from heaven at his baptism and on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Defining moments in Jesus' life at his baptism and from the Mount of Transfiguration where he really then focuses forward towards the cross. And so God brings into defining moments into our lives, he brings his definition of who we are. His beloved. Chosen. You might look and think, why on earth did he choose me? And I don't understand why he chose all of us, but he chose you anyway. Because he looks past all the other things that everybody else saw, or maybe all the failings that you saw, and he just said, just come and receive. Come to me. He chose you, beloved. Today he's well pleased with you. That you're in his family, that you belong to Jesus. So we need this, we need this high definition. You know, you might be familiar with that term from your television sets. You get HD TV. You get something far better than that. They, they, they change it all the time. That you just have to buy a new TV probably every few months to, to keep up with the technology. I refuse to do that. But I remember watching watching the football in the ordinary. Then it goes to HD, and you think, yeah, it's better. And then if you go back to not the HD, oh my, it looks so much worse again. You see, once you've seen in high definition, everything else looks a bit kind of poor. And God wants us to be a people who see in high definition. To see with an insight where God brings definition into this life. And to see and to hear his voice that defines things for us. See, if you're going to write things that are wrong, we don't decide what's right and what's wrong. God does. His word guides us in that. And we want to bring his definition into this world that brings divine solution, redemption, and grace. So to finish with, let's put up the... The last slide. What are we to do? What are we to do? You know, as the, as the church of Jesus Christ, as the ecclesia of God, God's people, I believe we are to be leaders in this world. Now, that doesn't mean we get all the attention. doesn't mean we're out in the street crying out our voice. doesn't mean we're going to run some political party or anything. But we should be leaders, even in that sometimes quite influential way. You know, sometimes a kingdom works like the yeast that just spreads through the dough. And sometimes we proclaim the good news aloud. We do it in both ways. But I believe that we should be the people. We're the salt and light. We should bring the lead and an influence. 
And Jesus brings justice upon the earth. We should be at the lead, at the front of that. Not chasing behind somewhere. Not just bringing some protesting voice somewhere else. But bringing a lead. This is the way that true justice comes upon the earth. It comes first by beholding God's servant, his chosen one. His chosen one and his chosen way. Beholding Jesus. And you know, as we behold Jesus, something happens. As we take time to behold him to worship him, to gaze upon him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold him, we are transformed into his likeness. One of the most important things I've sought to practice in my life is just to take time to just behold Jesus, sometimes without words, without anything, just, just to gaze. And it's hard because you can't see him physically and you need to kind of do it in the spirit and it's difficult, but it's so worth it just to behold him. Because as we, we lay our lives in a way of just, you know, we're, we're focused on him. He's the focus of our gaze, the gaze of our hearts. So we get transformed. We become like him. You become like what you behold. You become like what you worship. And as we worship the Lord, as we behold him, so he imprints himself upon us. We will carry something of his nature, his ways, his behavior into this world. But we will be those who heal the bruised reed and reignite the smoldering wick. Secondly, pursuing justice begins with beholding Jesus. Secondly, it comes through the spirit of the Lord and his kingdom increase. Verse 18, it said, I will put my spirit upon him. Even Jesus needed the Spirit upon him. He needed the filling and, and the anointing of the Spirit. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to those who have been up against it in life, to those who have been oppressed, to those who have known great injustice in their life. He says, I come to bring good news, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, to free the captives, to release the prisoners, to announce the year of God's favor. And so we have that same commission, but we need the Spirit upon us. It's the Spirit of the Lord moving upon us. So we come through the Spirit of the Lord to bring His justice and His kingdom. And as His kingdom comes, so oppression begins to move away. Jesus says to the Pharisees in verse 28 of the same chapter, If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. As we move by the Spirit of God and His authority to drive out darkness from our world, so the kingdom of God has come. And that's our goal, that's our aim. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And His kingdom, what's it like? His kingdom is righteousness. That in one way is just another word for justice. It's a very similar word. His kingdom is righteousness, where rights are wronged where his justice comes. But what else does that look like? His righteousness comes with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't want a justice that comes just with, with protest or with anger at things or, or any other motives. We want a justice that comes, a righteousness that comes through the Holy Spirit that brings with it peace and joy. May we be filled with that. May we behold Jesus more clearly today. May we have high definition, sight and insight. May we, through the power of the Spirit, bring his kingdom works that free the oppressed and that turn things around. May we bring divine solution into people's lives. And may we do it with joy and with peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what Jesus has brought to each one of us and what he continues to bring to us, but also what he releases through us into this world. May we continually know that encounter with your presence, with your word and your spirit, that it would release that transformational initiative in our lives, that we would make that difference daily in all manner of places, bring in the release of your kingdom, your justice, your truth, your righteousness. May we do it filled with your spirit, and your love, your joy, and your peace. In Jesus' name.